perspective that Robin over there and the, the Guardian, um, which was on the unburnable carbon, the latest unburnable carbon, carbon report from Carbon Canada. So a bit of context, <coughs> so um, I'm here with my kiln hat on, but this project actually is overlaps um, three of my sort of hats. Um, also being a Guardian journalist part time and um, author of a book about this topic. Um, I want to talk briefly about um, a thought that you might just like to see a really fancy graphic. Anyway, this talk, I just want to talk briefly about the content. I thought I'd set the scene for the Unburned Carbon um, stuff, and actually with my author hat on mainly, and then talk about how we approach it, because that feels like it's probably a more logical way to do it than straight in. And then I want to talk very briefly about the tools that we use to make it, which I think some of you have heard a bit about before. Um, so, just sort of zooming out briefly, asking a question to, to, to understand why this unburnable carbon cycle is so important. How are we doing solving climate change? Well, unlike most people who I speak to on this topic, most of in this room will know precisely what an exponential curve is. It's a, a curve that undergoes steady acceleration. Now, if you look at total carbon emission since 1850, academics at the University of Lancaster recently pointed out that if you add, add them all up, so not just the fossil fuel ones that we're used to seeing as the default data set because that's most of the energy we find now. But if you add in all the traditional energy sources such as biomass, then actually what you see is something really quite striking, which is that the total human contribution to um, climate change in terms of CO2 emissions has been an incredibly smooth exponential curve. But I say incredibly smooth, of course what's going on here is also you can see the oil prices in the 70s there, you can see the Great Depression here. So there are ups and downs, but it's always bounce back. Um, zoom on the last 10 years, and something very striking pops out, which is the fact that nothing that we've done yet has made a, a jot of difference to that global system output of CO2. Now, I'm going to race through these, because this is all just the context. Now, as we all know, um, there's a target to um, stop that curve going up and to uh, arrest the warming of 2 degrees C in order to avoid all sorts of potentially catastrophic consequences. And what that means in practice is that we have an overall carbon budget that we can't exceed. And <coughs> used to hearing, you know, 10% cut by 2013, whatever it will be, um, it's this that matters, the total amount of CO2 we commit ever. Now, the total numbers vary a little bit, but roughly speaking, if you want a 50% chance of success, then we can burn that much carbon relative to how much we burn in the quality industry. If you want a 75% chance, you've got to do something more like that. So what does that mean for the exponential curve that we just looked at? If you want 50% odds of success, you need to do something like that. Now, I think most people will look at that and think that's just going to be impossible. So why don't we, um, sorry, that's 75% odds. I put this the wrong way around. So if you reduce it to 50% odds, ignore the title, then unfortunately, you buy yourself a few years, this is speaking in 2020, which is the best that the global political process is currently aiming for and not anywhere near achieving. Um, you're still looking at something that looks like a kind of terrifyingly sharp turnaround. Um, so you might think, okay, well, maybe running out of fuel would help with this, because the most exponential systems we talk about in the book generally run out when the food source is cut off and the population insects in a jar or whatever. Um, unfortunately, there's far more coal oil or gas, carbon in oil, oil, oil gas, in the proven reserves than we can burn if we want either the 50% chance, which is the middle part, or the 75% chance of success. So and that's just the proven reserves, um, which is what the interactive I'm going to talk about later uh, focus on. If you actually zoom out and you recognize that there's been an, that exponential curve is driven by our increasing technological capacity to get fuel out of the ground. So although fuel is getting harder to reach, they're more expensive and everything, we're also getting better and better at getting it out. Um, so you think of things like shale oil and shale gas. If you add in all the unconventional reserves, then <coughs> this is probably a bit far-fetched because most of that coal will remain uneconomic. But that's a technically recoverable fuel resource in the world as defined by the IEA. And that's what we can burn for a 50% chance, that's what we can burn for a 75% chance of success. Even if you scrap all the coal and just look at the oil and gas, it's pretty obvious that we are going to have to leave the overwhelming majority of it in the ground if we want anything other than a poor chance of meeting the world's safety climate change goal. So you might think the politicians are going to do it on our behalf, and we've got a problem there. You look at the current pledges at the national level, and not only are they <coughs> grossly inadequate compared to what we need for two degrees. But they're also based on a slightly problematic assumption, that, which is that if we re reduce the UK's emissions, say, by 100 megatons of, uh, of CO2, 
CO2, then that will reduce global emissions by 100 megatons of CO2. But of course, if you look at a global system, there's no reason to believe that if we don't burn some oil or gas, that Gazprom or Saudi Arabia won't take it out of the ground. It's quite possible it will get, just get burned elsewhere. So this standard way of looking at it is in fact very oversimplistic. If you look at what's happened in the last 10 years, you've had this remarkable pickup in the developing world just as the developed world has started constraining its emissions. So we can't work on the assumption that that's even realistic. So if that's not going to do it, you can think, well, what's going to happen? Could we just increase energy efficiency? And, well, you can, but the worrying reality is that we've been increasing energy efficiency for the last 150 years, in fact, longer. And it hasn't made a job difference to that exponential curve. Why? Because reducing um, the inefficiency of the system doesn't mean that the, the, this whole system will slow down. It's just a quick schematic to give an impression of that. We've got more efficient cars. Some of us would use less fuel, but that would lower the global oil price line more people to use elsewhere. Um, we'd also save some money, which we'd have to spend on other things, which would have a carbon footprint. Other people, some of them will drive a bit more. That will offset some of the gains. But then you've got all these indirect ripple effects. If someone drives more, then hey, we're more suburbia. Suburban homes tend to be bigger, bigger homes take more energy to heat, etc., etc. So it's quite easy to see how efficiency, whilst useful, is not in itself going to reduce the amount of fuel we take out of the ground. Other people think, well, maybe slowing population growth is important. But actually, if you look at what's happened to the rate of population increase over the last 50 years, it's fallen like a stone since 1960. Average woman now has two children compared to five in the early 1960s. And it's made absolutely no difference to the rate of increase in emissions. Could we just virtualize the economy, as our goal was talking about the other day? Again, the problem there, it obviously relates to the efficiency point, if the energy intensity of the economy and the amount of energy we use for each unit of GDP has been falling for at least 40 years, then it hasn't done a thing to the global emissions curve. Can we just build more clean energy? That seems a really obvious one. Well, yes, that would be good. But actually, we have been building clean energy, as people such as climate change capital document um, daily. The problem is, even at the overall amount of carbon we create for each unit of energy globally, it's been remarkably flat for the last 50 years, and most worryingly since about the late 1990s, it's actually been creeping up. I think that little thing here is a blip in the data, but roughly speaking, it's going in the wrong direction. The reason is not that we're not building clean energy, it's that we're building oil, coal, and gas faster. And in order to understand why those two things actually go very naturally hand in hand, it's necessary to just quickly see the whole world of the system. And if you look at this, is total human energy consumption since 1850. So a close reflection of the exponential graph we looked at earlier on those is energy supply as opposed to carbon emissions. One thing that jumps out when you look at this is that when we discovered coal in the 1850s, well, we discovered we started ramping up coal use from the 1850s, that biomass actually increased. So we didn't use less biomass when we found coal. We used more, sort of blip around here. And then we discovered oil. So what happened when we discovered oil? Did we say, well, oil is a more kind of energy dense and clean burning and transportable fuel with coal? No, we increased our coal use. Why? Because the oil helps get more coal out of the ground. I mean, coal mines are run with oil. Then we discovered gas. We started building more hydro, started building more nuclear. Now, of course, those are clean burning energy sources or clean energy sources. So the natural assumption might be, the kind of common sense policymaker assumption, is if we have more of those, we'll have less of the fossil fuels, right? But of course that's not true. Actually, what these energy sources have done is driven a technological revolution that has led to things like the microchip and the internet. And now we've got the internet, we're even better at getting oil and gas out of the ground because we've got better technology for finding it and better technology for literally hammering, for example, fracking, all of which is a, te a technology that is an engineering-based technology that's been very much helped by digital um, developments. So you might look at all that and think, well, you know, there's nothing we can do. We're absolutely screwed. Um, but the answer is that there is something we can do. <laughs> <laughs> but what is it? And it's, it's my second fancy graphic. We <laughs> just burn these things and leave them in the ground. And it is as simple as that. We can do all the other stuff. And the other stuff, the way to think of them is it, they are all enablers of us, of us doing this. If we crack down on fossil fuels whilst increasing efficiency, then it won't cost us as much. If we build clean energy capacity while we crank down on this, then we can have as much utility as we have now um, and stimulate a little bit of economic activity whilst we're doing the painful thing of getting rid of it. But there's no way around it. We have to consciously decide to get rid of this fuel. So the people who have been pushing this argument most strongly are a group called Carbon Tracker. Um, I'm sure lots of you would have heard of them or know the people involved. 
they released their report about a month ago, and um, this was an update on a report they did a couple of years ago, and it basically looked at the state of what's going on in the capital markets around um, fossil fuel reserves. And their main point is that if you look at those graphs that I showed before, it's very obvious we've got to leave most of the fuel in the ground, and yet these companies, such as BP, Shell, Peabody, all the others, have an active policy of trying to expand their reserves, which would be fine if that was just, you know, maybe they'll, maybe we just won't bother solving climate change and those reserves will be found and, and, and used, in which case that would have been a good business decision. The problem is they're doing it with everyone else's money. So they're doing it with pension funds and they're spending an average of nearly $7 billion a year just expanding their reserves. Anyway, so they went into this incredible debt um, and they came to Kiln, me and Robin, to, to say we'd like to represent this stuff online in a way that would be, that would do two things. So the first thing I want to do is just tell the story, so to sort of articulate what it is about, um, what the unburnable carbon story is. And secondly, they want to map all their data. Um, but the thing that was interesting about the brief is they want to do both of those things in one piece of content. So the natural way to do the top thing would probably be an animation or a video. The natural way to do the bottom thing would be an interactive. So just shift into. So this, some of you would have seen before, so this is Robin and mine's first project with Kion. And so, I think we even talked about a clean work thing once. Um, the thing that was relevant about this is that this was an interactive map that shows where all the carbon emissions are, who, where the, uh, see there, where the uh, fossil fuel is extracted, where it's burned, where the goods are consumed, that kind of stuff. But what was relevant about this project is the introduction, which... Welcome to the carbon map. We used to see the world like this. So if countries are resized to represent the true area, it actually looks more like this. So you get the impression but of where it's all you with this again. All it's doing is talking you through it. So we thought, could we develop that technology which basically talks you through a website, and it's a tool that we've released open source called Talkie, which would be great for everyone to use. Could we develop that in such a way that you could do more conventional animation with, so that we could make an animation that was also an interactive? And in a way that's very rare with web development, we actually stumbled across something that um, a workflow that made it really much easier than we expected. Um, I'm not really a very techy person, so I, I did the design stuff in Illustrator, and Robin built the tool that basically made it very easy to take an Illustrator file, um, which the, the non sort of creatives in quotes in the room is the standard graphic design program for making vector drawing and to turn those into interactive animation. So I'll show you what we came up with and I'll show you quickly how we did it. As we burn oil, coal and gas, the world is getting warmer. And to avoid the worst impacts, nations have agreed to limit global warming to two degrees Celsius. The latest analysis suggests that to meet this target, global emissions need to remain within a carbon budget of five to 900 gigatons of carbon dioxide by 2050. That's far less than what will be emitted for all the world's current oil, coal and gas reserves burned. Even with an optimistic rollout of carbon <coughs> capture technology, most of these reserves are burnable. New research by Carbon Tracker shows that just the reserves owned by companies listed on stock exchanges contain enough carbon to create more than 762 gigatons of carbon dioxide. And those companies are currently spending $674 billion each year to find and develop yet more reserves. Fossil fuel companies raise money from pension funds, lenders, and other investors, and use the capital to develop more reserves. Investors assume that the fuel will be extracted, leading to coal, oil, and gas sales, and generating revenues. But when carbon limits are introduced, less fuel will be consumed, and reserves will become stranded assets that no longer provide returns. If companies keep spending at the same level over the next decade, listed companies alone would own more carbon than the budget for the whole century. $6.74 trillion of capital expenditure, possibly your pension fund, could be wasted developing unburnable reserves. Investors need to know that they are exposed to this carbon bubble so that capital can be diverted into low carbon growth. To make sense of this issue, we've laid out all the data on this map. It shows how much carbon is held by companies listed on <coughs> each major stock exchange. So I won't make you sit through the whole thing. But the point is, is that what you're now looking at, although it looks like a video, isn't. And if I click on one of these bubbles, then I'll just pause the intro so that we're not doing two things at once. But the point is, in the same piece of content, you're actually looking at a, uh, a 
data map, so oil, carbon, and gas. We've got here how much those companies are worth, so you can see that New York is by far the, uh, and that's the capital expenditure, that's how much the oil and gas companies and coal companies are spending on expanding reserve, roughly speaking. And you can see that most of that's going on in New York, which makes the New York Stock Exchange uniquely exposed to a possible carbon model if we ever get our act together to uh, sort the problem out. Um, but actually, London, given where we are, is worth highlighting here. In terms of the total amount of carbon, you often hear that the UK only releases a few percent of global emissions, and that's true. But actually, in terms of where we're home to, we're home to 100 gigatons of CO2, which is three years' worth of current emissions, and more worryingly, about a seventh of the, uh, more like a fifth, fifth or a seventh, depending on these numbers you believe, of the total amount of carbon we can burn with a good chance of falling to degree. <coughs> So the point is, what I wanted to get to is just so that this is a classic north, but this is a kind of data visualization. Um, but what we wanted to do is incorporate a story that, um, that made it engaging <coughs> with the and that's what Talky allowed us to do. Um, just briefly on the map itself, um, for the techies in the room, what we wanted to do originally was do something much more in-depth with the data. We wanted to be able to show the individual oil companies how much carbon's in their reserves, what percent of the global carbon budget is BP, for example. Um, unfortunately, that data wasn't, um, we couldn't make public in the end. Um, so we were left with actually a very flat data set. And what we wanted to do is make it, going back to the carbon map example, we, we found that when we made those countries squish, people were kind of interested in them just because they moved in a kind of tactile way. So we wanted to try and recreate something a bit like that. So we used deep freeze, um, force directed mechanisms and stuff to just mean that these um, bubbles move around just in a slightly organic way. And so far, I've certainly discovered that people looking at this like to just click around it because they'd like to see how the things move, which may not be exactly the end, but at least they're engaging with it. And then at the end, if you did watch the whole intro, it would talk you through and uh, encourage you to do stuff like this. So that's where I'm going to leave it. I'll just go to one tiny <coughs> example. This is just something which was relevant and, and sort of um, topical. Uh, this was, again, using the Talky library to do something similar to animate. Uh, graphs in a way that um, helps explain a complex story. So what this is, is the Keating curve, which I'm sure you're all aware of, in the news a lot because we crossed 400 parts of the moon the other day. Um, so what we did here is just make a little interactive that shows that all these things have happened, like the Kyoto Protocol, do you see any rate of change, uh, any rate of slow down? No. But where Talky really came to, to its own for doing this sort of thing is you can do stuff like that, zoom in on it in a way that normally you'd only see on a, on a flat video that this is actually interactive. So the same thing as before. But because you can manipulate complex shapes, you can take that key and curve and show actually that's what it looks like in this context of 2,000 years, which immediately gives you that kind of wow. And I think if you just show those two graphs next to each other, you don't get that same sense of, OK, I'm really understanding how it fits in. That, just that simple movement of a few hundred points across <coughs> the page makes it that bit, bit more comprehensible. Just to finish it off, that's where we're heading based on the emission scenarios that are currently being used for the new IPCC report. And then the really scary one at the end, if you want to see that in the context of the last million years, it's quite important it is that we're going to leave most of that carbon in the ground. Um, so, that's the, uh, that's the end of it. Thanks for listening. Who was it who made the report? It was Carbon Track, and actually they, right. they, they, they wanted to. It wasn't that, I mean, it was an unusual situation um, because they've made some of the data available already, but they were very keen um, for all the right reasons that they wanted people, they wanted companies to come and talk to them about their, um, how they fit into the picture. And so they wanted to see this as the beginning of a dialogue with all the fossil fuel companies. I think they felt that if we just stuck all the data and made it public, it would A, look a bit more like we were finger pointing, which might be less useful, and B, that people might just look at it and think there's not another layer to go and discover. But um, I mean, I might be uh, misunderstanding the motives, but we'll, uh, we'll send you a DIY. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, working out the narrative around not finger pointing, but yeah. that's something we should do. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's a problem we would have liked to have had, um, but it wasn't to be in that project. Okay, Jamie. So just a quick question about the, um, the kind of result of all of that. I mean, you've educated people really well with it, and it's incredibly powerful. Um, but I, I, I don't find the sort of right to your pension manager 
thing at the end that compelling. And I wondered whether the, um, the group behind the carbon tracker had, had thought about what it really means to identify this risk. Because mm. presumably they're trying to draw the analogy that it's a financial risk of some sort and that these companies are taking a huge financial risk because they're gambling on whether or not there's going to be legislation that mandates them not to, to Exactly. Burn the and, and so, I mean, it's a really good question. The, I mean, you probably noticed a little nod to that in the uh, in the script halfway through. It said possibly your pension fund, as in you know your savings could be at risk here. And again, you know, classic um, case of things taking longer than you think. So actually, making that animation at the beginning was relatively quick to get up and running. But building the tool took so long that we slightly scaled back the scope of the overall project, which originally was going to have a much more complete right to your pension fund part as part three, so you do the intro, the, the, the data, and then you are encouraged to do something much more compelling at the end. And that would have been framed all around, this is going to be your risk. But as it happened, Carbon Tracker were working with another, they were working with Fair Pensions, who work on this stuff. They were building a tool as well, and it all was getting a bit complicated. So we thought, um, in the time available, the best thing to do was just to link through to that. But I think, I completely agree, it would be great if you know it told you that story and then said, OK, really going to hold your hand through the last stage, because that's where are you going to get any impact? Okay, and the last question from Michael. Thanks very much. That's great. I um, enjoyed it. Um, I, um, I was just wondering about the, the re response from Big Oil and friends. And I, I suspected that um, one of them would be, oh, well, technology is going to be such that we're going to extract this carbon from the, from the atmosphere. Um, and uh, this is coming along, so unless we are competitive in exploring for more reserves and, and drilling and mining, etc., we're going to yeah. be at a, a, a financial disadvantage, and, and that's what the, they're, they're saying. But I, I also guess they probably say a number of other things, and I just wondered what, what well, sort of response Well, the main thing they do is say from. nothing at all, actually. I mean, what's interesting is if you look at, um, for example, if you read the BP Energy Trends for 2030 report, um, one of the things we point out in the book is that uh, it's very striking that if you look at, the, say, the IEA, you look at their different energy scenarios, and there's the kind of default, there's the if we're bit half-assed about solving climate change. Here's what it looks like in terms of policy and output stuff if we really go for it and we decide to meet the target. Look at the BP energy scenario to 2030, and they basically just implicitly conclude that there is no scenario that where we solve climate change, and that emissions, you know, there's no plausible way that they could peak before 2030. Now, even, even the kind of, even in the, the failing global negotiations around climate change, people aren't saying we're not going to peak until 2030. So mainly it's just a case of straightforward denial by the fossil fuel industry, I think. But there is also a bit of what you say about, um, you know, maybe we can expand our reserves and maybe ours will be the cheapest to get out, or maybe ours will be, uh, we can burn them with carbon capture. But the carbon capture argument, which is in a way the more natural one, um, given that actually all the really cheap oils get out of the ground is in the Middle East, most of it anyway, um, the, that argument doesn't really stack up because one of the things that the new carbon tracker report did, and we didn't really have time to go into this in the interactive, but one of the things it did over and above the previous report was have what does an idealized scenario for CCS look like? And they added the caveats that, you know, that scenario may not be technically plausible, it's not funded at the moment, and um, but even if you just say, okay, suddenly we're going to all wake up tomorrow and be really into CCS. How much does that change the overall budget? And because when you look at the curve, I mean, you think of that graph I showed before, you would have come down so steeply so quickly that the next 10 years when most of the emissions, next 10 to 20 years when most of the emissions are going to be, are going to come out. And CCS, it's implausible to see it scaling up to a really significant level before then. And even if it does, of course, it only deals with the point sources and only the point sources where you're near enough to a point of extraction. So that goes to your other point, which is, well, you know, could, could they just say, well, mine all this stuff and then we'll suck it out of the ground? Now, that's a case that they could make. I've never heard anyone from a fossil fuel company say that, and I think the reason is they'd know that would sound a bit desperate, and it's almost certainly cheaper to leave the fuels in the ground and use some alternative energy than it is to burn them and then use the alternative energy to try and extract CO2 back down. But um, possibly I'm wrong about that, and some of them think that that's the reason for doing it. Okay, we're slightly ahead of time, which gives us the chance to ask one more question whilst Connor sets up for the next uh, for, for, for the next talk. Actually, so uh, are you are you are you another James, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, 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 that's that's okay. So yeah, James, go 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 for it. So um, the, the thing that I found 
I think I, I guess I have a slight problem with with um, scenario. Um, basically, the financial risk will only come about if there's we legislate. Yeah. So, given that there's money involved, doesn't that mean that it's just more likely that we won't legislate? And how do we, and how mean, we kind of invert those forces to? Yeah. And actually, you know, obviously this was a product made for carbon tracker. And actually, when I've been writing about this journalistically, my view has always been, you can read this two ways. One, the market's behaving irrationally, and uh, they're going to suffer a lot of pain when we wake up to this and do what's required. Option two is the market's behaving perfectly irrationally. They've looked at it, they've decided we're not going to solve climate change, and most of those reserves are going to get burned. Um, and, you know, what the book is really about is saying, once you realise that that's the choice, then what you need is a massive civil society response to demand that we go for um, option one. And so if we demand the response, it must be this. Certainly. Exactly, yeah. But what's interesting at the moment is that it's not, you know, if you took a really cold, um, rational market view of this, it falls into one of those two camps. But actually, if you, if, you, if you see what's happening, it's more nuanced and subtle because most of the big investors are still pushing for oil companies to worry about the traditional metrics such as um, reserves to extraction ratios and all that kind of stuff. And, um, but most of those, a lot of those pension fund managers at least, according to people like Fair Pension, <coughs> dialogue, do think we're going to solve climate change. They just haven't made the connection. So, which is why I think the carbon tracker works so important because all of these things, like all market-based things, are partly about confidence. And once, if governments started making more noises that actually we are going to get more serious about climate change, it could happen quite quickly that the view of the markets flipped, and actually the fossil fuel companies are in a, in quite a lot of trouble because they borrow. For another one of the data sets on this is debt, and a lot of the fossil fuel companies are now in massive amounts of debt. But certainly, people like Carmen Jack think in the next few years they may start to not be able to recapitalise. At which point, that will have turned out to be a serious problem. But if in three years' time, you know, we get to the 2015 deadline for a global emissions deal and nothing's being done, then. Yeah. Cool.